So in that passage that was just read to us, we have the account of the children of Israel and, and the golden calf. And I want you just to get this picture in your mind in terms of what is going on here. Moses had led the children of Israel out of Egypt, um, bringing them to the foot of Mount Sinai. So they had wandered, and they had camped at the bottom of Mount Sinai. Exodus 19, Exodus 20, we have the account of God coming down, and it talks about in thunder and the sound of a trumpet. And God comes down and speaks in the hearing of the people gathered around the foot of the mountain, the Ten Commandments. If we look at the number of people, there was over 600,000 fighting men. So you throw wives and children and older people in that mix. There probably was two million of them gathered around the foot of the mountain there. Going forward from God giving them the Ten Commandments, then what transpires? God gives them sundry laws dealing with society. And then we come into Exodus 24, or where God calls Moses up on the mountain. And we know that Moses was on that mountain for how long? 40 days and 40 nights. And there on the mountain, God gave Moses instructions in terms of how to set up the tabernacle, how to construct it. Um, the, he gave them details on the furnishings and the garments of the priests in terms of what would occur in that tabernacle. And the end of those 40 days, Moses had fasted this time. At the end of the 40 days, we had that passage where God then inscribes with his fingers the Ten Commandments on these two tablets of stone. But while Moses was on the mountain, and I might add in Exodus 24, it says, Moses went up in the cloud on the mountain, but from their perspective, on the mountain, the top of the mountain looked as if it was a consuming fire probably giving light to the people that were there at the foot of the mountain. Well, Moses is up there for 40 days, so what are we saying? Like a month and a week? Let's say five weeks. What transpires? Well, the children of Israel that were down at the bottom were saying, you know, let's set up these gods. They had come from an Egyptian, Egyptian society where religious worship and idols was always prevalent. It's something that everyone did. And in part of pagan worship, when they'd worship idols, and you can see this throughout the, uh, the then known world, always attached to it was always um, sexual immorality. So it was more than just going to the temple and bowing down at the idols, but there was all this other stuff associated with it. And so the children of Israel, who had heard God say what? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee a graven image in the likeness of anything in the heavens above, or in the earth beneath, or in the water underneath the earth. They heard that, they were shaking in their boots, and they said to Moses, don't let God speak to us. You go speak to God, but don't, let, don't speak to us directly. But here, what did they do? In, in direct contradiction to what God had already said, they set up this pagan worship. And so there on the mountain, Moses was unaware what was going down, down in the valley, or down at the foot of the mountain, uh, we have God then speaking to them in terms of the response. And then as, we, as was read to us in, in Exodus 32, verse 7, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they're stiff-necked. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them, that I may destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we bow in your presence here this morning, we just ask that you would clear our minds, that you would clear our thoughts. And as we consider your character, your immutability, Lord. We just ask that you would give us a glimpse of your glory. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come in our midst, that you would speak to us in a mighty way and be, and be glorified with us this morning. For we ask this in Christ's name and through what he accomplished on the cross on our behalf. Amen. Now we're taking a, a few weeks to, to discuss what we call the attributes of God. And, you, and I guess that would be what we would term as theology. And you may be asking me, um, 
why do we need theology? Is that not something for the academics? But I'd like to keep in mind that at one time people thought in terms of the universe and how the solar system worked, they thought the Earth was the center of the solar system. And so they, and the Bible doesn't say that, but because the Earth and the solar system was created for man, they came to that conclusion, though Scripture doesn't state that. And so they said that the Earth was fixed and the sun moved around the Earth. Now, if you've gone to school, you probably know that isn't quite correct. But they then had this problem because people, they always want to, especially if you live by an ocean, you want to chart the tides, when is high tide, when is low tide, so I know if I've got to go out in my boat, I can get it out of the sand. And the, or they were wanting to look at the movement of the stars in the sky or how seasons in the years, and even when we talk about uh, the 21st of March and the 21st of June, the oldest or the longest and the shortest day. How does all that work? And as they tried to model it, it never worked. It didn't fit. But it wasn't until they got the sun fixed in the sky and the earth moving around the sun that their models, they now had models they could take and use um, for, for their activities. And in the same way, when I think about theology, for me to make, have my world makes sense and my life to make sense because we all struggle with different circumstances we don't think about it every day but we do struggle with it but it's not until we have God in the right place and we can see how we relate to God from our position does it start making sense and so I would have to say we need to take some time and talk about these attributes of God and so whether you're a seasoned Christian or a new Christian or you're sitting here because you're just curious, it's an important study that we all need to embark on, just as it would say in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. A correct understanding of God allows us to have a correct understanding or opens the, gives us the ability to have a correct understanding of everything else. So we better start, I guess, with a bit of a definition, because immutability of God, immutability is not a word that we kind of use in our daily banter. Um, for systematic theology in my home, I use Burkhoff. I, I find it good and concise. We all, so you, there's different definitions essentially saying the same thing. But that's the perfection of God, that God is devoid of all change not only in his being, but in his perfections and his purposes and his promises. God is devoid of all change. So then when we look at the attributes of God, there's basically two silos relating to those attributes, isn't there? We have what we call his communicable attributes, attributes of God that we share in. Those attributes, we talk about justice and love. Um, we talk about... Uh, we talk about spirituality being a spirit and knowledge. Those are things that, and they're often easier for us to understand because we can share in them to a certain extent. Those are these communicable attributes. And then there's these other attributes that reside in God alone. We call them these incommunicable attributes. And so that would be such as God's self-existence or God's infinity. And the one we want to look at is immutability. Now, Immutability would probably come from a, a Latin word, and I like to keep in mind, English is a bit of a vacuum sucking up words from all different languages, but it, it comes from a Latin word, mutablis, meaning to change. And so we would tend to, in our society, use that word quite a bit from a biological context, don't we, or connotations associated. We talk about mutate or mutations. I think even my kids, there was... Uh, Mutant ninja, ninja or something like that? I, I could be wrong. It's probably in the toy box downstairs. But mutation and mutate means to change in its essential being. We have a God who's an immutable God who is incapable of change. And so if you're sitting here this morning, you're probably wondering, then, if that's what we're talking about, why did the last verse up here is God changed his mind? or in some of our other versions, why did God relent? Because there are these passages in Scripture that gives questions. And I would say 
Christianity and God is big enough for all the questions that we can bring him. And so if you have your questions, it's important that we dig in and address the, those questions. And so, and, our, and as I said, our God is big enough for every question that we bring. So in our passage here in Exodus 32, what happened? Well, I said God had made a covenant to Abraham. That would have been 500 years before. Um, and now God was ready to destroy the nation. And as I said, Moses then seeks the favor of God. And it says then uh, God relents or God changes his mind. And he didn't bring the, the disaster. We could go forward a couple months. We get to Kadesh Barnea, right on the edge of the promised land. And the spies go in. And as kids, you'd sing 10 were bad and two were good or something like that. And the spies come back. And they say, this place is amazing, but we don't have a prayer. And the people start whining, wanting to go back to Egypt. And again, God was ready to destroy him. And Moses cries out to God on their behalf. In fact, I think there's about 12 to 15 times in Scripture where we read that God repents, God relents, God changes his mind. And so that, I think, leaves us with the question, does God change? Does God change his mind? How do we reconcile this immut immutability, this inability to change, with what we're talking about? And so this morning, I'm going to need you to think, you know, use your, I, as I say at work, use your brain to try and wrestle through some of these things to see how they fit together. Because when we talk about the Im immutability of God, there's basically four main passages that deal with the immutability of God. There's um, Psalm 102 that talks about God's being doesn't change. There's Malachi chapter 3 that talks about God's promises don't, do not change. James chapter 1 talks about God's purposes don't change. And I want to conclude, if I get there, in terms of dealing with this witch doctor, Balaam, who prophesies that God doesn't change his mind. So if that doesn't cause some um, headache in your head, uh, then you're not paying attention. But let's start by saying God's being does not change. So God, as I said, is never fickle or wavering. Um, the psalm is talking about God doesn't change in contrast to man. But look at the context in which it's given. If we go into Exodus 32, what's happening? These people worshiping God, promising to follow God, entering a covenant with God, a couple weeks later now are what? Bowing down to idols in direct contradiction to what God said. They change, we change, and you're probably not the same person you were five years ago or ten years ago. Your kids change you. I think even your diet changes you. Um, work changes you. We constantly change, but God does not. And so we're seeing here that in our, from our perspective as human beings, we often would say, well, what's permanent? And when we look at what's permanent, probably nothing we make, because even if we construct a building of concrete, it's still going to get torn down. Um, we would look at the mountains and say that they're permanent and unchangeable. But you would go into Psalm 102, and we read, and it's quoted again over in Hebrews chapter 1, but in Psalm 102 it says, In the beginning you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like a garment. Like clothing you will change them, and they will be discarded but you remain the same, and your years will never end. So the Bible teaches that this present world will be tossed aside like an old frayed out shirt. But even when that occurs, God does not change. And you see, I would say you see this throughout Scripture, this idea of the, the immutability of God. Even in terms of the name that he takes to him, he told Moses, what name would he use? Um, I am. I am who I am. There's no past with God. There's no future with God. God, God is always in present. You have that verse from Hebrews 13. Jesus Christ is what? The same yesterday, today, forever. You go into Revelation. Revelation, Jesus is what? The Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. There was no change with God. So scripture clearly teaches that God's being, his person, does not change. So I cannot, there can be no addition to God. There can be no detraction from God. 
God cannot become better or worse, so that, which has, I would say, enormous implications to us because even our everlasting hills are going to be tossed aside. But God doesn't change. And so when I come to Scripture, all Scripture, I need to then take that understanding of the Word of God and bring it into passages such as Exodus 32, where we, where we sometimes maybe have what is an apparent contradiction. But if God doesn't change, then I think we need to, as we even look at that and make sense of what's going on, God had called Moses up into the mountain. God had given Moses a whole system of worship that revolved around the temple, or the tabernacle at that point that became the temple. There were sacrifices, you know, the burnt offering, the meal offering, the sin offering, um, the sin offering, the guilt offering, Day of Atonement, and the list goes on. There was a whole system there. But if God doesn't change, then what is going on? So there is, so then, because we know as we look at the full unfolding of Scripture, we see that throughout Scripture, God is unfolding his plan of redemption. He would use at different times and in different places different methods to teach us about himself that's unfolding. But I think it's important to understand that the only thing that could pay the price for sin is what? Well, the only thing that could pay the price for sin, a consequence of sin, would obviously for me, would be hell for all eternity, absence from the presence of God. But the only thing that could pay that price would, could be God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And so if God doesn't change in terms of what's going on in our understanding of Scripture, then when I look at it, then how did Moses and Abraham enter a relationship with God? Well, they, they entered a relationship with God no different than how you and I would enter a relationship with God. That they entered a relationship with God because they themselves were sinners, just as you and I were sinners. Um, they entered it on the basis of faith. And that faith was based on the finished work of Jesus Christ because he alone could pay the price for sin. So then, as I said, I just want to get the, your brain juices moving here. So then in terms of salvation, it was always the same. Sure, they expressed that faith differently. But they were saved on the basis of faith just as you and I are required to do, just as it would say in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you are saved through faith, and it is a gift of God not of works, lest any should boast. So God's person doesn't change. There is no change in God. But we also go on as we move through Scripture, we see that God's promises do not change. Um, and I said, I, I, I want to just read from Malachi chapter 3, 6, and 7. And I like the emphaticness of the King James, the authorized version in that verse. I think Tyndall renders it right. For I am the Lord... I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Now, what's happening here? And I will hopefully bring us back to Exodus 32. Who is Malachi? Well, Malachi was the last prophet in the Old Testament. The children of this would have been a thousand years after Moses. As a consequence of sin, God had, had taken them out of the land. They had come back to the land under Ezra and Nehemiah and restored a system of worship there, this, the sacrificial system. But what were people doing? Well, rather than bringing their best to God, what would they bring? Well, just something that would look good. They would bring their sick and lame animals as an offering. Basically, they were giving God what we would call the leftovers. They weren't giving God the first place. They were just kind of fitting them into the life that they lived. I think it's probably no different than sometimes I find myself falling in, that I want to look at my Christianity as kind of a spectator sport. Do you know what I mean? Well, I come for an hour on a Sunday morning, and I really, because it's what I do, and the songs are okay. And then, but they were great this morning. But the, <laughs> I come for my hour, and I don't give it another thought until I have to get the kids ready the next week to come to church and do it all over again. It's really just giving God the leftovers. Well, that isn't what God is calling for. But the prophet in Malachi is declaring that although they were doing that, God, what? He continued to remain faithful, that they're worthy of being judged, 
But they weren't judged at that point. Why? Because God continued to act in grace towards them because of the promise that he had made to Abraham 1,500 years before, which is really no different than what we see in Exodus 32. The children of Israel for sure were worthy of judgment. God was fully within his rights to, um, to judge them for that sin. But Moses, what did he do? He appealed to the promises that God had made because God's promises do not change. It was worthy of judgment, but God listened to his request, Moses' request, and held it off at that point in time. And so we, we see here, as I, as I kind of look at it, that God, in saying that to Moses, God had promised to make a nation out of Abraham. God had promised to bring them into the land. And in, in one sense, God have, could have fulfilled his word, because his word doesn't change, because he cannot change, through Moses. But I, I think it's important, as I kind of look at this and try and put it together, that although they, Malachi and passage of Malachi and also in that they were Exodus 32 as they were gathered around the golden calf they were worthy of judgment but God held back his hand because of a commitment he had made God does not change his word does not change and I can take that to the bank um, that brings comfort for those that are his children these sons of Jacob and I suppose it brings terror for those who are not but if God's promises doesn't, don't change, then I think it's also important that we understand that God can never elevate one of his attributes to sacrifice another. Do you know what I mean? So when I talk to some of my Muslim friends, and they'll tell me about all the things that they have to do to be right with God. And I'll, I, I've, this has happened a couple times, and I'll say to them, well, what if you sin against God? And the response has always been, well, God is merciful. And that's true, God is merciful, but God is never merciful to sacrifice his justice. God holds because he can't change and his words can't change. All of his attributes are held up at the same level. And there's no depreciation from one to elevate another. So for God to show us mercy also had to satisfy his just requirements. So we see that even at Calvary, we see God pouring out the judgment that our sins deserve on Jesus Christ so that we could even read, as we read in Romans chapter 4, that God could be just, but he could also be the justifier. He could make us just. He could show us mercy because his justice was fully satisfied. God never um, depreciates one attribute to elevate another. All are held up in tandem, which does, again, force us to ask the question, then what side of God's favor am I on? God's being doesn't change. God's promises do not change. But also God's purposes do not change. And I have these verses from uh, James chapter 1, 16 and 17, where we, where we read, don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. God, in dealing with us, deals with us according to his purposes. Deals with us, uh, deals with us as a source for his children, deals with us for his good. Now that verse in James is given... I, I want to just put it in context for a minute because you, if you were there in your Bibles and you back up two verses, what does it say? It says, God does not tempt any man with sin, but a man is tempted when he's drawn aside by his own lusts and enticed. So we see there that God never tempts with evil. God never tempts us to sin. That sin is the response that I make. And then to drive the point home, James says... God never tempts us to sin because God only deals with us according to his purposes and those purposes are for our welfare. It's for, it's to be pour out on us his goodness. So as I try and tie that together, God's being doesn't change, God's promises do not change, God's 
purposes don't, do not change, then as I kind of look at what's happening in Exodus 32, we're not, we, we are not given what was going through Moses' mind. We only see God's response. But we see that God was dealing with Moses consistent with his character, fully within his rights, um, because judgment was deserved. We see that God was dealing with Moses for Moses' good and for the good of the children of Israel that were there. Because God cannot change in any of those attributes. And, and so that, just in case, like, if you had that question, is God tempting Moses to sin? Say, well, sure, make a nation out of me. That sounds great. But I, I would tend to, as I look at that, based on the total scripture, God would have known Moses' response, but in, go, in God, in dealing with us, only deals with us for our good is the source of every good and perfect gift. Just as we would read in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, who have been called, what? Accordingly to his purposes. God's being doesn't change, God's promises don't change, and his purposes don't change. Because the long and short of it is, God does not change his mind. So our final passage is that I want to read was from Numbers 23, 19 and 20. Now, Balaam, essentially Balaam was a witch doctor. If you, you need, and if, you know, and I, I need to maybe, if some of these stories are new to you, we've got some great resources. I often find even Ergemeyer's Bible stories has kind of written at a grade six, seven, eight level. Gives you those overviews if you don't know these Bible stories. But Balaam essentially is a witch doctor that wanted some money. And so he was asked to put a curse on the children of Israel. And he would do whatever he wanted to do so that he could pronounce that curse. Yet when he stood up to pronounce the oracle, the Spirit of God came upon him. And he uttered prophecy. And so in his second prophecy, he declared in Numbers 23, 19 and 20. And I, I, I like it from the... The previous version of the NIV where it says, where it says, the one on the screen says, God is not a human that he should um, lie, nor a human being that he should change his mind. I kind of like it more emphatic. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I've received the command to bless. He is blessed and I cannot change it. So we see... As I pull that back to Exodus 32, we see God speaking to, me, to Moses as he speaks to us, speaking us into terms that maybe we understand. So, because there are a few t places in Scripture where we kind of perceive that God has changed his mind, God has had second thoughts. Um, and I, I would say for the most part, that is God speaking to us in a way that we can get our mind around. I guess if you're smart, they call that an anthropopathism, ascribing a human emotion to God. There's also an anthropomorphism that ascribes a, like a, a wing to God, a human body part to God. But I think, as I said, the, that always, we have limited comprehension to fully understand the immutability of God. We tend to look at immutability, inability to change, like rock or concrete, something static, stoic, doesn't move. But we need, when we come to the pages of Scripture, we see that God is immutable, incapable of change, but he's not inflexible. Right? So in Exodus 32, it shows us that God can and does move in his actions, and his, in his emotions when he's given a proper grounds for doing so. But he does not change in his identity and in his character. So as I look at that, we have a God who doesn't change, but we have a God who has compassion on us. We have a God that accepts our choice to follow him. God has compassion on us as sinners. God is moved by our prayers. All of that under the, the umbrella of this God who doesn't change. And so, as I said, um, 
we tend, because we're human, want to think about the dimension, the, in terms of the dimensions that we live in, when we talk about these things and we say God doesn't change or God is sovereign, we often want to look, you know, sometimes people give me this argument, well, then am I not just a typewriter then? And God hits the keys and I do what God says. Well, that's true in one sense, but it is totally wrong. Because God's immutability is, over, is greater than even our ability to comprehend it. That God's will is accomplished even when in the aspect where there's movement and choice at man. And I can't scientifically reconcile the two together, but I do know from Scripture that they both, they both exist. And so we see, as it says in Numbers, God does not change his mind. So what's happening in Exodus 32? If God does not change his mind. When we look at the context, we see in Exodus 32 that he was going to judge the children of Israel for their sins. They fully deserved what they were going to receive. And God didn't change his mind on that conclusion, did he? We can go on in the chapter, and verse 33 and 34 of Exodus 32 says, The Lord replied to Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go lead the people to the place I spoke of, and my angel will go before you. However, when, it, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish for their sins. So what does that mean to us? We have a God who is immutable, but as I said, we have a God who is moved by our prayers, all within the umbrella, under the umbrella of his character and will. Some would want to argue, well, if God can't change, then why change? Why pray? Because God's, what God's going to do, God's going to do. Well, I think there's a bit of a helpful quote that helps me get my mind around it. And maybe I'll read the full thing, and if I had had my act together, it would be on the PowerPoint, so I apologize. Um, I need to make some changes, too. But God is omniscient, an all-knowing being who cannot change his mind. If he does, he's not really all-knowing. Therefore, not God cannot change his mind in answer to prayer. When we pray, or have prayed, God only knew what we were going to pray, but he ordained our prayers as a means of accomplishing his purpose. Prayer is not a means by which we change God. It's a means by which God changes us. Prayer is not a means of us overcoming God's reluctance. It's a way for God to take hold of our willingness. Prayer is not a means of getting our will done in heaven. But it's a means that God uses of getting his will done on earth. You see, we're not fatalistic just accepting what will happen because that's God's will. Well, that position is wrong. But we have a God who is greater and not bound by our limitations, that his immutability exists even over our position, but we know under that umbrella we have a God that moves in his actions and emotions towards us when they're consistent with his will and his purpose. So that it would say in James, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. God is moved by our prayers, but God is manipulated. And do you see the difference there? We, it's not a genie that we just keep rubbing and maybe they'll finally it'll pop out of the lamp. Prayer is answered when it's in accordance with God's character and his will for the, those of lives involved. And when you think about it, if God's purpose is, is to always operate in, what's be, in my best interest, what is best for me for my good, then why would you not, why would you want a God to answer prayer that isn't consistent with that purpose? And so as I see our time's ticking away, just a few implications. So um, we have a, a cottage. Not that I wanted a cottage, but there's a lot of things I didn't want, but in a place called Port Loring, Northern Ontario. And we're on what we call the Pickerel River system. And so we can take the boat and go, you know, I can drive the boat 30, 40 miles down that river and go into a bunch of lakes and, and um, do whatever you do at a cottage. But there's a few places where there's rocks in the river. And if I don't want to damage the prop on my boat, what do I do? Well, I 
I have something that's fixed. I'm the one that moves. And in the same way we have, if we have this God that is immutable and capable of change, who doesn't change, then the only one who can change is you and I. And I would say there's a, I would, three implications from this text as a starting point. I would say, first of all, then, there's some work that's required on each of our parts so that we assess and understand a better, or gain a better understanding of God. That we have a God that is knowable, that God that wants to be known, but he does what? He does tell us to draw near. And so for you to get to know God, at some point some sl- you're s- you enter a relationship with God on the basis of faith, but it is a journey, and at some point you need to roll up your sleeves and, and spend time in Scripture. And if this whole thing is new to you, um, we have an Alpha program here in I think it's, it will be starting in September, kind of an introduction to a Christian faith where you can ask your questions and there can be conversation. But again, it's a start. It's a process. And uh, I said to go deeper in your relationship with God, that's more than a coffee and a daily bread as you head out the door, that some work is involved and it's well worth the work. But as well, I think there's a warning in the text, just as a, that God will never change his mind. God cannot change his mind. Once you've made your choice, he does leave us with the ability to choose underneath that umbrella of his sovereignty and his immutability. But the choice that we make are valid choices, but there is a question because it said, I am the Lord, I change not, therefore you sons of Jacob are not consumed. So there is a real question that I cannot leave the immutability of God or Exodus 32 uh, without asking the question. Am I in that place of God's favor? Have I entered a relationship with God so that I'm his child? Because outside that place of God's favor, there's, there's terror, whether you want to mention it, accept it or not. And, and the beauty of it is all of us are born in that same position. All have fallen, sh- sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God, through Christ, has made provision for that sin. But there's, God leaves us with a choice that we are required to make a choice to follow him. That you can even do that as you sit here this morning. It's to silently pray and ask God to forgive you for your sins and give your life to him. So there's work, there's warning, and finally I would say there's warmth that we can rest in the immutability of God. It's a bit of a gray day. When the clouds come in, it can be dark, right? And, and there's times when it gets so dark that in the house you have to put the lights on in the middle of the day. And there'd be storm, and there could be hail or wind, or, you know, even in Elmira there can be tornadoes, violent weather. But you know what? Regardless of what it looks like outside my window, the sun is still shining in the sky. It has never moved. There may be clouds that block my view, but the sun is still there. And the beauty of it, when we think of the immutability of God, when, even when I think of some of the sorrows that we've gone through recently as a family, we know that God is immutable. God does not change. And regardless of the circumstances and events or what he takes me through, he still, his being doesn't change, his promises do not change, and his purpose and intention of goodness in my life has not changed. And I can rest in that immutability and gain great comfort to it. I see our time is gone. Let's pray. It could be as you're sitting here this morning, you've got some questions as a result of our conversations. And and as I said, we have a God who's bigger and willing for all our questions. So please uh, talk to me or someone here. There's usually people at the front as well if you need to pray. Let's pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, as we bow in your presence now, we thank you that you are a God who is immutable, that you do not change, that your purposes and your promises are there regardless of the circumstances in our lives. Lord, we just ask that you would give us a fresh impression of you this morning, that you would allow us, help us to go deeper in our relationship with you. And we thank you. You are the God who is. You are the God that loves us, has created us, and given and sent your son to die on the cross for our sins.
Lord, be with us this day. Amen. As we say, it's the service uh, time is gone. Have a great week. God bless.